Welcome to 25 Things Every Teacher Should Know to Support the Success of First Nation Students, facilitated by Deb St. Amon. My name is Kelpana McCann, and I'm your moderator for this session. We acknowledge first and foremost that we are gathered in the province of Ontario on the traditional territories of various Indigenous peoples who have been present on this land known as Turtle Island since time memorial. We acknowledge that this has been a meeting ground for generations. We are grateful to the stewards and caretakers of this land. As advocates, teachers, and educators, we understand our collective responsibility to honor, protect, and sustain this land. We further recognize and honor within the membership of OTF those who are Indigenous to this land. This practice of recognizing the ancestral and traditional lands in which we work, live, and play is a concrete action that we undertake as a first step towards reconciliation between Canadians and the Indigenous peoples of this land. But it is not our only step. Collectively and individually, we must seek to denounce the injustices and the wrongs that have been committed against the First Nations, Métis and Inuit peoples, and to dedicate ourselves to cultivating and maintaining relationships based on mutual respect and truth. Our facilitator for the session is Deb St. Amon. Deb is an Anishinaabe elder, elder and currently serves as the elder in residence in the Faculty of Education at Queen's University. Her father was Métis and her mother is Ojibwe. Deb became a teacher in 1982 and was involved in Federation work throughout her teaching career. Deb retired from teaching in 2012 and enjoys guest speaking about Indigenous issues and other equity themes. Deb has worked with OTF and COPA to produce numerous resources for teachers about Indigenous education. She continues to support OTF with her wisdom, life experiences, and knowledge of Indigenous culture and teaching. At this point, I'm going to stop sharing my screen, and I'm going to ask Deb if she's able to share her screen. And while she's doing that, we'll just go over a couple of housekeeping items. So, I again, I'm your moderator. My job is to make sure this runs smoothly, so if the slides go down, I can bring them up for you. If you have any questions while Deb is presenting, please, pay, you know, please place your questions in the chat or raise your hand, and I'll direct her to them if she doesn't happen to see them. If you have any technical issues, please send me a chat. Just send me a message in the chat directly. I will do my best to support you in any way. At the end of Deb's presentation, I've got about two little slides to share with you around the link for the website and where you can go and get the archival version for this, our upcoming presentation, as well as a survey we're asking participants to take. Deb, are you ready? Um, it says that you've disabled um, participant sharing when I try to share my screen. Okay, well, let's get you back on. Oh, I think because you logged out, so let's make you... Sorry. <laughs> A co-host. There you go, Deb. Okay, now it's working. Perfect. So, on behalf of everyone at OTF, thank you so much for joining us this this afternoon and into the evening. And Deb, take it away. Thanks. I'm just trying to see. Where... Oh, that's that did not work right. Um, I'm just trying. Okay. I wanted to put it on slideshow before that things came up there. <laughs> Sorry. Um, That's okay. I, okay. I put it on slideshow. Then it should work. Maybe not. Okay, you're just going to see everything that's on the sides. Okay. So that should be okay. Um, so I had made a different um, title for this. It said like 25 things. Etc. But um, my computer is not working well today, so this is how it's going to be. So, Bojo, Beji Guabshke, Mangin Gwiti Gabon Dijnakaz, Minwa Deb Senema Ndago, Makwa Ndorem, Penetanguishin Minwa Henbil Inlet First Nation and Dunjaba, Trenton and Dao, Nishnabi Kweyo Day. So, in Anishnabi, when I'm introducing myself and saying that my name is Beji Guabshke, Mangin Gwiti Gabo. Um, that means one white wolf standing in all four directions, and I'm also known as Deb Sanama. That Makwa um, Ndora means that I'm Bear Clan, and um, I was born in Penetanguishene, which is a um, small Métis settlement here in Ontario. That we were originally Drummond Islanders, and when uh, the Americans won their war in 1812, um, the Métis that were on Drummond Island that wanted to remain loyal to the crown, we settled in the Penetanguishene area and the Red River area of Manitoba. And 
on my mom's side were from Henvin, Henvi Inlet First Nation, which is a small First Nation between Perry Sound and Sudbury. And I live in Trenton. So uh, because I'm we're indigenous, I'm indigenous and um, we are the land, we always situate ourselves on the land. And I said that I have an Anishinaabe heart. So um, I was a teacher for 30 years. I, I was never the indigenous education teacher but um, because I was indigenous, um, people, the, the, the students knew that I was indigenous and they would quite often follow me around. Um, I liked to wear my buckskin jacket and they would follow me around and they'd be braiding my, my uh, fringe there. And whenever if there was a problem that I had to head off to, I'd quite often have like little kids dragging behind me as I'm trying to head toward them with um, them still braiding the, the back of me. I'm just gonna apologize if you can see my face, it looks different than in the photo. That photo was taken um, six years ago. We probably should update it. Um, so we're working on our 25 ideas. Um, this photo is a, a photo, I think it was like 2014, the very first year that we indigenous um, people started marking orange shirt day. Um, Deb, I'm sorry, for, Deb, I'm sorry yeah. for interrupting you. We're just seeing the very first slide, so it's not advancing to slide number three is where I think you are speaking from. Correct? I think I'm. I think I'm on four. It's okay, so like it's moving on my screen. Maybe you should share your screen. Okay, so why don't I? Oh, wait a second. It yeah, it says my screen sharing is paused. Did you pause it? No. Um, it says my screen sharing is paused for some reason. I don't know how to unpause it. You may have to um, click on the little thing at the top that says enable editing enable. so that it will listen to you. Do, you. do you have a yellow box at the top that you I see? do have a yellow box at the top. Um, I, it doesn't say enable editing. Oh, resume share. Oh, did that work? Did something happen? I don't know. We're not seeing anything. We're seeing the very first slide. Oh, there we go. We are now good. Okay. It says, it does say that I am screen sharing now. Yes. I apologize. Perfect. So, so 2014, I believe was the first year that we started having orange shirt day. So I made my own shirt because you couldn't purchase shirts that say every child matters at the time. So I just made my own with like fabric markers and I've been honoring that day ever since. Um, so that that's important to me. I, I think as an educator, the number one thing that I would say to do is to get to know your students and get to know them well. I usually tell teachers, do not look at students with um, your eyes, but look at them with your heart because um, it's um, important to um, look at them with love because some of them are, are coming from homes or, or foster homes where they're not necessarily feeling the love. Like I know a lot of foster parents are loving and caring, but uh, like sometimes the children would prefer to be in their own home. And I'm saying this because I, I think the, the number is 75% of kids in, in foster care are indigenous kids. So um, getting to know them and looking around your room, um, and, and this applies to like children of all nations. I think it's super important to get to know um, this, the students that you're teaching, like talk to them when you're outside at, on duty and, and such, like not just, not just seeing them in their regular classroom. And, and for me, that meant in my teaching career, it might mean going to watch them play soccer or hockey or to their dance recital or um, um, places like seeing them out in the community. Um, I, I think that's important for the students. I think that it's also important that um, we learn as much as we can about the indigenous um, histories and cultures, especially particular to the area um, in which you are teaching, because it might not be the area that you're from, but you should um, make the effort to learn about the histories and culture and not always rely on the indigenous people to be the ones teaching you. Um, there are lots of um, resources to help us. Um, when I 
when people are saying, well, I don't necessarily know what lands I'm on. I think all schools in Ontario now make a land acknowledgement. So you can learn from that. If you're somebody who like travels a little bit within the province, what I do is I look on the Canadian Association of University Teachers website and they have like a website of all the universities and colleges across Canada and they have their land acknowledgements there. So you can find out from um, there as, as well, like whose land you're on and to learn a little bit about the history there too. Like you can ask the indigenous people of the area, but they shouldn't be like your only source of information because not every indigenous person wants to be the history teacher. Like I look at, I have a son who's also a teacher here in Ontario and he doesn't even usually tell his colleagues that he's indigenous, like his friend, the colleagues that are his friends know that he's indigenous, but he doesn't want to be the indigenous expert at the school. He wants to concentrate on geography and math and not have people always coming to him with indigenous questions because just because a person is indigenous does not mean that they know everything about every other indigenous culture. I think it's important to uh, know how many of your students self-identify. I'm just going to turn on my lights here because it was dark. I wasn't this dark when I came home. One second. Um, we, we can't always tell who's Indigenous in our classrooms by looking at them. For example, there was one year I had a class of 20, 26 students, and on the first day of school, when I looked in my classroom, 23 of them had, like, bleach, bleach blonde hair. Of, these were grade fives. And I, I, I thought, oh, wow, like, what, what happened that, like, all of the grade fives this one year are, are this... this each blonde hair I'm never going to be able to like learn their names because they all look the same so I, I went to look in the other grade five classes room to see if they had like more variety of hair colors in there but and there were but in my class of like 20 something blonde kids out of um, 26 13 of them self-identified as indigenous and when I was saying to the principal, you know, like 13 of my students self-identify, she said, no, you've got a class full of blonde kids. Like they don't, they're not indigenous. And uh, yes, they were. So we come in all sizes, all shapes, all colors, all hair colors. And um, quite often you won't know um, if a student self-identifies unless they feel like they're in a safe place. And even sometimes if they're in a safe place, I remember one year when I was teaching, when uh, I, for, toward the end of my career when I was doing a lot of work with the Federation, um, they had me teaching core French. And there was like one boy in grade eight core French. I'd been teaching him all year. It was the end of the year, June 21st. It was Indigenous Peoples Day. And I had invited in an Indigenous um, carver to come in and show his carvings on, on that day and to talk to the kids. So the carver comes in, he's got all of his sculptures and um, or carvings. And uh, he says to the, all of the grade eights, um, who here is indigenous? And this one boy that I'd been teaching for about three years puts up his hands and puts up his hand. And I said, hey, you never told me you were indigenous. And he said, you are the French teacher. I hate French. Why would I ever tell you that I'm indigenous? So it depends on what subject you teach to, whether they let you know or not. Because if they don't like the subject, they might not let you know that they're indigenous like that young boy did. But it's, it, I think it's important to, to know. I, I think um, using culturally responsive education and what that would look like um, in our classrooms, I, I think unless you're indigenous, it would be bringing in indigenous knowledge keepers or elders, or if there are if some of the students' parents um, or older siblings want to come in and share, I, I think doing that is important. Um, the people in this photograph our students up in Arwapiskat at the, um, the new school there and um, are newish. And this is inside their um, outdoor classroom. So this was the day we were up there. We were trying to teach them how to build a fire without, um, without using matches or, or a lighter um, because we thought that was a skill that they could um, use. Um, 
but bringing in people, unless you're Indigenous, bringing in um, people and every school board in Ontario has an Indigenous lead or po possibly a whole Indigenous team that could um, recommend people who could come into your classes for you. I think um, recognizing intergenerational trauma is important. Um, the trauma of the residential schools um, continues to this day. And um, because people who attended residential schools, because they were taken away from loving families and raised by um, people who were not necessarily kind to students, people who were mean and abused them and didn't show them like the love that they needed. And, and, and because um, if the indigenous families um, kept the students too, too long after Christmas holidays or something, then the children were not allowed to go back home again. And so then they were taken from loving families and, and put into these situations where they weren't allowed to talk to their siblings, they were punished for everything. And um, so then when they were, I'm not gonna say they graduated because most of them didn't learn very good um, educational skills. Um, most people that were, because they were basically being slaves, like they were like cooking or they were being, um, used in ex medical experiments, et cetera. So it wasn't, they, those, they call them schools, but they were more like um, children's prisons. People who survived that have had to do a lot of work in order to um, right those wrongs and to learn how to be good parents. Because if you're taken away from your parents for 10 years in, in your formative years, you don't necessarily know how to be a good parent. If all you've ever seen is punishment and being yelled at and punished. So I think that's important um, to remember. In this, particular, in this particular picture, this little guy is a, a guy in grade six. And um, he's the one who tried the hardest to, to uh, light the fire using this um, bow method. And uh, he stuck with it, but if you, he was left-handed, so and I stuck with him the whole time to help him. If if you look on his right hand, you see a bunch of scars, and uh, he was in grade six at this point. Those scars had healed up, but he had tried to commit suicide by looking at his hand and cutting where he saw the veins, um, not realizing that he had to hit an artery, um, and so he survived, which is good but this is like a result of intergenerational trauma of not, not having the happy home life that he necessarily would want um, because parents didn't know how to be um, good parents and parents are still learning how to be good parents because it takes a while to un undo like all of that negativity. Um, I, I think that um, communicating with caregivers in, is important. And um, when um, in Indigenous communities, it, it's important to um, go out into the community to meet the caregivers because they're not necessarily going to come to the school because of intergenerational trauma. It's hard for Indigenous people sometimes, not all, but some, to walk into an institution like a school. And I'm just gonna relate something that happened to me. I was a teacher for 30 years. And over the last 11 years since I retired, I, I continue to walk into schools. But walking into, I mean, the first summer that I got hired, um, when I went to the school to get my schedule, I walked, I opened up the, the doors and the, it was a really old building. Um, and when I opened the door, I just felt energy coming past me. It was scary. I shut the door and I waited for someone else to come to walk into the school with me. And I always walked into the school with someone. I never walked into the school alone. Like when it was summertime, the principal would always say, Dad, do you want a key so you can come into the school anytime in the summer? 
And my answer was always, no, I don't want a key. I'll come in when someone else is coming in. Because, um, and I didn't go to residential schools and neither did my parents, but we, we still carry that trauma um, of the residential school system. So walking into a building is difficult. So I also tell people, when you bring an elder or knowledge keeper into your classroom, have if you can't meet them at the front door of the school, have students there to meet them and bring them in because it's really hard to make those first few steps. And I still find it hard, like after being like in the profession for like 41 years, I, I still find it really hard to walk into a school. And it's like a really, really rare occasion when I will actually walk into a school um, alone. So if you can meet them, like at a Tim Hortons or out in the community at the soccer field, like watching the children play at the skate park or, or whatever it is, it's, it's, they're more likely to talk to you because it's not that indigenous parents or caregivers um, don't want their children to succeed. It's really hard sometimes to, to walk into those um, spaces. Um, and it really does take a community to raise a child. So many Indigenous um, children are not being raised by their parents. Like I said, 75% of kids in foster care are Indigenous. Um, so many of the children that are Indigenous are being raised by grandparents instead of their parents. So it does take a, a community to, to raise um, to raise a child or, or the children. This little guy on the left having a tea party with my cat is um, one of my grandsons. Um, but it takes, it takes everyone. Like, so a lot of the stuff that um, I'm involved in, because I'm also the elder in residence at the Kingston Native Center and Language Nest is doing um, intergenerational activities. To, so that the grandparents and the parents and the children are all learning together and realizing that. And also realizing that because so many Indigenous kids are in care that hopefully teachers aren't still doing things like um, having kids make cards or gifts for Mother's Day or Father's Day, because that is like really cruel to the kids that are constantly being taken away from parents or are being raised by their grandparents. And I know teachers say, well, you can give it to your grandmother or you can give it to like whoever you want. It, it's still hard for those kids to be the, the one in the class that um, doesn't have access to their parents. Um, they say that like the child welfare system is the new residential school because so many of our kids are, are there. Um, establishing discipline. And what would that look like? You really have, this is part of getting to know your students too and deciding what's gonna work for you and the students in your class. So co-designing what discipline will look like in your class, especially if they're older students. Sometimes having like some rules in mind that you can get the um, students to agree to. I think my last year, my last year of teaching I was teaching a, a grade five class in the morning and then I was doing in French art, drama, dance and phys ed with um, grades five through eight. And um, there was one little Mohawk girl in my grade five class and grade five was like, I was teaching grade five um, extended French. It was the entry point for French um, in, our, in our board for French immersion, I mean, or extended French. And, um, she had been used to being kicked out of the class all the time. She spent a lot of a lot of her time in the the hallways when she was in grade two, three and four, and probably lower down too. So when she came to grade five, she was fully expecting to spend time in the hall. But I'm I'm not a putting kids out in the hall kind of person. I would just let her be. I I knew that she was being raised by her grandmother, and that. Um, she had um, challenges that way. So she liked to crawl around, like she would, she, she liked to crawl around on the floor. 
and previous teachers would put her out in the hall because she wasn't paying attention. But I could see her get like worked up and need to do something. So she would start crawling. So the first month of school, I, I just said to her, you can crawl. I don't care. I, I'm fine. If you are listening, you can crawl around, but you may not touch anybody's desk or chair or any person. Crawl to your heart's content. So by the end of the month, she wasn't crawling anymore. Um, she would just stay in her seat. But when I would see, I had an arrangement with the secretary, the school secretary, that um, when I could see that she needed a, a change of venue or, or something like she was getting uptight, I would give her an envelope, a sealed envelope, and ask her to take it down to the secretary downstairs. And she would take it down. And the secretary we, like, would just accept it. And then later in the day, if I need, I saw she needed um, to get moving around again, I would send her down to see if the secretary had a response. And she'd send back up my, my um, envelope. But sometimes I would say to her, when you go downstairs, do you mind walking through the, the primary wing? Because I noticed that their their boots aren't very tidy and like some it's a tripping hazard. And for the little kids that are in the wheelchairs, like those boots need to be tidy. Like, do you mind just taking a couple of moments and tidying up, tidying up the boots? And she would go down there and she'd tidy up all the boots and she'd come back and she'd be willing to work. That was a, a better way to um get her back in, integrated into a classroom where she would stay in a classroom. So sometimes you have to look at the child and, and decide like, why are they making this? Why, are, why, why do they have this behavior? And can discipline look like kindness instead of like always being mean? I remember um, when my son first started teaching, I don't know, about eight years or so ago, he was teaching a, a a French class for two weeks, which he did not. He did not want to teach French, but he could. So he was in this grade in this French class, and um, at the time he was living at home. And he came home and he said, "This class is terrible. I, I'm going to have to come up with a, a way to uh, like to discipline them." And I said, and he was thinking in terms of punishment. And I said, "Well, what if instead of a punishment, you offered a reward system? Like if you come into your French class every day." And you tell them, these are my expectations. If we get this done, then, I don't know, we could go outside and play soccer in French or, or, or something else. And I think that's important to you. Like some people um, are quick to look at disciplining rather than looking at caring for the child because every um, poor behavior is a, a cry out for some kind of help and love. That, that's, my, that's my beliefs. Um, using culturally relevant materials also important when um, back when I was teaching there were a lot of indigenous resources but ever since the, the TRC calls to action there have been significantly more indigenous authors and um, I, I think it's important to, like if you're going to read in your class you could be reading indige an indigenous author instead of another author. I, I, I really am happy that so many um, school boards have adopted the NBE3, the English, um, the Indigenous focused um, English course and made that mandatory for the grade 11 because we have um, fantastic Indigenous, uh, Indigenous authors now that we could be reading. And um, when I was helping to do PD on this with uh, other school boards, uh, I, I said that I myself went to school. I did most of my high school in England and not once. Like we can, I came back to Canada and good, did grade 13. That's the only high school I did here. Not once in England did we have to read Shakespeare. Never. And in Canada, Shakespeare was part of the English curriculum every single year. When I was a teacher, it was and um, teaching English, I felt that if I introduced the students to an author and they wanted to read more from that author, then I had done my job. I didn't have to read five books of Shakespeare to anybody to make them want to learn more Shakespeare. So I, I think that's important. Um, goodminds.com is a great source for indigenous materials. They, um, 
they have people read each um, book before they decide whether or not they'll sell it to make sure that it's culturally um, relevant, that is appropriate, that it's not like calling us um, like slurs like savages or anything like that, um, that they make sure that it's um, an appropriate book that they, they will use in their, uh, that they can recommend to people to use in classrooms. Um, and I know that they do that because there have been times where there, there were times when Jeff owned Good Minds. It's been sold since when Jeff owned um, Good Minds. I, I've seen him at book fairs with like a box of books. And he, and he'll, he said to me, Deb, I've got this books, box of books, but I've not had a chance to have any of my staff read the book to see if it was appropriate. Will you read this book for me? And it was like a picture book. So it was like super easy and fast for me to read. So um, I was able to um uh, approve it for him so so that other teachers could be able to buy that book and use that book in their classrooms so i think that's important um if we go to sources like that they they've got it used to be just online but they do have a storefront in in Brantford but it's it, if you go to their website they have it all in categories like if you're looking for like high school or kindergarten, if you're looking for French, it, it's all categorized and easy to find the resources that you're, you're looking for. I, I think um, including First Nations, Métis, Inuit perspectives in every part of the curriculum is important. So um, whether it's in art or if it's in music or, or math, science, um, bringing that in because um, some people think that they do one indigenous thing and then, then they're done. But um, I grew up never having an indigenous teacher in, in the classroom, um, never seeing myself reflected in the, the books or any materials that were in the classroom. Um, I do admit that like six years of my education were in Europe, <laughs> but before going to Europe and, and after, like there, there was nothing indigenous back when I was growing up. So um, I think it's important. And um, the government had, like the Ministry of Ed had started to put more indigenous um, materials in the curriculum. And then we got like a different government and that all halted. But despite that, Indigenous educators continue to get together and make resources for math and make resources for science. And if, if you're looking for a place to find some resources, the National Film Board has fantastic um, resources um, that are Indigenous and um, the First Nations Métis Inuit Education Association of Ontario also has fantastic um, resources like videos and lessons that you can use in your classrooms as well for like all um, K to 12 um, students. So that is important too. I think, um, well, I know that using talking circles is an effective way um, to teach. Um, toward the end of my career, um, before they put me back in core French, when I still had um, extended French, um, I, I would try to have my class in circle all of the time. And we would, um, in the morning when the students arrived, we would put our chairs inside on the inside circle with our, our desks behind us to have a check-in. and. Then during the day, if we were working in partners or in groups, like some could be sitting on the inside of the circle, some on the outside of the circle. And um, at the end of the day, we also ended with a circle. Um, the reason I like to start each day with a circle is because you don't know what those kids have already gone through before they come to school. Like some of them have been through a lot, like maybe a pet died or maybe they're... Um, they had a fight with their friend or, or, or something. Um, we just always, it, it was the practice in the classroom that we would just have a quick check-in. Everybody would say how they were feeling that day. 
and at the end the check-in was um mostly something that they were um happy that they did that day so whether it was like the math lesson or the science lesson and part of my reason for um, right at the end of the day, asking them for something that they were happy about or they enjoyed during the day was because um, I gave birth to sons. And whenever I asked them what they did at school, they never did anything at school. I don't know how they got to be where they are right now without ever learning anything at school. But um, you have to learn to ask them different questions. Like, who did you work with in math? <laughs> or um, stuff like because if you ask them like what you learned they're, they're never going to share I'm, I, I hear some people share but my kids were never sharers um i'm going to go back to the talking circles for the talking circles there are rules for talking circles it means like rules the circle is nice because there's we're all equal in the circle we're all teachers and we're all learners and um the circle has no beginning no end so I, I think that that's important. In my classroom, I had when uh, among the student desks, I also had like a desk that I would um, sit at. Well, I had about three of them in the circle that 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 were designated for me or or guests. So that quite often when we were working or reading or doing something together, I just sat in the circle with them. And I remember one day I was teaching in a portable, and the principal came out. And she did a quick scan of the portable and nobody was standing up. So she assumed there was no teacher there, but I was sitting doing math with a couple of my students in the circle. And so she said, well, where's your teacher? And one of the little girls stood up and said, in this classroom, there are 22 students and 22 teachers. Um, which teacher in particular were you looking for? Because I, I think it's important for them to know that they also um, are, your teachers, you learn from them every single day. And when students would come into my class, whether I, I always taught elementary, uh, whether it was um, grade eight or grade five, at the beginning of the year, I would say to them, I'm going to learn as much from you each day as you're probably gonna learn from me. And they would never believe me, but um, eventually they would catch on that, like they were actually teaching me stuff because kids are, in, in my culture, kids are one of our greatest teachers. I think um, using hands-on activity is important. This is just another picture of the kids trying to get the little flame going in that um, nest that they had made to, to make our fire. I think using hands-on activities is important for lots of grades. Um, for me, Yep. Deb, can I interrupt you for a second? The First Nation Métis and the Inuit Education Association of Ontario, it seems that when people go onto the website, they are required to log in. Um, so our... Um, it, it's unusual. I've been to their site many times and usually you can get right on. So I'm, I think there may be something um, just wrong with the site right now. Um, I, can, I can reach out to them Deb, to uh, to see what's going on with the site. Not right now, but then we can provide the link again in the after the uh, after the presentation. Uh, I th yeah, because I think you can usually get in. Yes, usually no problem. They've got lots of really good resources. Mm -hmm. okay. mm -hmm. I hope that helps, Bree. Thanks. No worries. So, um, when I was teaching, because I was teaching French. <laughs> And I didn't like to use English in my class. I, I would, for science, I would, we always did like hands-on experiments and, and such because that's like the kids enjoy doing the hands-on activities, like being able to do scientific experiments, to be able to touch things. Um, and um, I, I found that it was also a good um, method of dis discipline for my class. I, I think um, I had uh, this one class where the, the kids liked to, uh, the, it, it was, it was a, a very difficult class. And um, the boys in that, the, the previous year, they, they had caused their teacher to have a nervous breakdown because they tried to burn down his portable. They kept putting 
flies in his coffee. They were just being nasty to him all of the time. So um, the following year, um, the, te- their, the principal had me teach grade seven, even though I didn't want to teach grade seven at that time. He had me teach grade seven. And um, his words to me, these were, this is an exact quote from him. I do not care if these um, children learn one damn bit of curriculum. I want them to be good citizens. And I know that you will make them good citizens. So for that group, um, it it was like a tough slogging to get them to be good citizens. Um, A lot of the boys in the group did not uh, like math. So, and like I was, like I've said already, I was a teacher who did not put kids out in the hall. Um, But math was after morning recess. So they would always like, get in fights at morning recess because I was also not on duty and somebody else would send them to the principal's office and they would miss part of math. So um, yeah, we had to figure out something to do with that. But I I think that's maybe one of my next slides where I talk about scheduling. Um, Because I I was teaching grade, just grade seven, I, I looked on the gym schedule to see who had gym right after um, morning recess and I went to that teacher and I said hey my students are getting in fights I'm pretty sure it's because they're trying to get out of math and, and they know that they'll get in a fight out in the schoolyard and the teachers are afraid a lot of teachers are afraid of grade sevens and eights so they send them to the principal and I don't want my kids at the principal's office I want them in class learning so can we switch and they did switch as soon as I had um, phys ed right after morning recess there were no fights because they wanted to be able to do phys ed. So then after lunch, I made sure that we had science right after lunch because they loved doing the hands-on stuff. And there were never any fights at that recess either because um, they like to be able to use their hands for things other than fighting. (laughs) Um, Setting up your classroom too for a lot of my career, probably about like half of my career, I was a core French teacher. And most of the time I did not have my own classroom. Some of the time I did, but most of the time I had to go in, in other people's classes. And it was generally rows, which for me, I, like I hate rows. I prefer groups or you or, you or, or circles. So um, I would quite often change the seating plan for the room, but we'd like, we'd have like 40 minutes of French. So they'd have to learn how to change the desk quickly and then change them back quickly so that if they wanted to be in groups and of course they wanted to be in groups too i my preferred method is like the circle and like me teaching just in the circle like sitting in the circle with them because that, that's the way that that's how we traditionally taught was we're all sitting in a circle and we're, we're all equals so i think that helps a lot in my circle in my class Um, every two weeks we changed where we sat in the circle and there would always be like some parent would say oh my daughter can't be sitting beside x person in the class and I say well the good news is it's only going to be for two weeks and then they're going to get to move again so we have to learn to get along with each other and uh yeah If, if it was like some major reason why they couldn't be there I would move them a little bit but mostly it was two weeks maximum and I figure when they get out in the job force they're not always get, going to get to choose who their desk is beside or who they get to work with so I think that's important too. I think um, setting clear expectations and um, for for me when on the, on the report card when you have to write like what the student is like, like, I forget what you call that, what that word is, but anyway, I like to use the seven grandfather teachings, like, are they being respectful? Are they being loving? Are they courageous? Like, do they try things that could be harder? Um, uh, By setting clear expectations, I also mean, like, quite often, if you look in, like, um, resources, they have, um, exemplars what's going to be a level three what's going to be a level four I I think letting the the class know what you're looking for for example if 
if my math class, if I'm going to be marking a chart that they do, like say it's a bar graph, I would say to them, you're going to get a mark for having the title. You're going to get a mark for lab or a mark for each axis that you label. You're going to get a mark for actually using a ruler and making your line straight. You're going to get a mark for having each bar the same width, like not having some like three centimeters and some two centimeters. I, I gave them exact, like this is how you're going to get your 10 points. And so that they knew how to get it. And they like if they got a seven out of 10, they could look and see, oh yeah, I, I forgot. I didn't put my title. I didn't put whatever. So that um, they know how to be successful. I, I think also when I would teach um, my grade eights how to write an essay, like I would say to them, every paragraph, I want you to start, make a point and then use about three sentences of proving that point and then summarize your point. That's what I want every paragraph to look like in when you're writing an essay. And like I had students come back to me after finishing their master's degree and say, you know what? The way you taught me to write an essay in grade eight got me all through high school. I couldn't believe kids from other classes didn't know how to write essays. Got me all through my undergrad and got me my master's because you showed me exactly how to write um, an, an essay. Or when I would teach them to paint, I, I would give them, I would show them how to um, shade and how to highlight and how to, like in, in grade five, they still like to like stick a sun in every single picture. And I say, then I'm, I'm gonna tell you right now, you, you stick a sun in one of my pictures, unless I ask you, like if you're painting something for me, unless I ask you to do a sunrise or a sunset, you're not gonna get a good mark if you put a sun in. But if I can tell where the sun is based on how you're shading and highlighting, and I would show them how to do that, um, then you're going to get a good mark. And they could make beautiful paintings. Like their parents would say, I can't believe my son painted that. But um, they need people to actually teach them step by step how to do things. And I think that's really important for so many of the students because, like, a lot of people like they're afraid of art and they say, uh, I want you to draw a picture, but they don't explain to their child how to draw a picture. How many adults do you know that say, oh, I can't even draw a stick figure because nobody has shown them how to do um, art. I think it's important. So this is my scheduling and timetabling when I was on about to like scheduling the subjects so, so that you have um ones that the that they're going to look forward to scattered throughout the day so so that if they're um really tactile kids in your class if they need to be moving around schedule gym at a time when it's going to give them a break between math and english or or that if you're in a high school it's really difficult to um, do your scheduling and timetabling because like you have so many working parts there. But I think um, within your class, like you've got a long period of time, it, it's important to mix it up a bit within your class, like not spend the whole 72 minutes or whatever number of min minutes it is doing one thing, like have an intro part, have a part where they're getting to get up and move, have, have a part where they're sitting and writing if, if that's what you're going to um, do but don't have like the whole lesson be like just one thing like this lesson here sitting and listening to me all night this is a terrible lesson but um that's not a good way to teach kids but it's it's an efficient way to get this information to you right now me sitting here talking to you like like i wouldn't want to teach children <laughs> this way or i'd break it up into like smaller bits for them so that it's they can get through it faster. And um, I think allowing for wait time is also an important thing. Indigenous people, we need some tea. Um, we have wait time. They, like probably when I'm talking, there are times when I'm pausing and you're probably thinking she's trying to think what she's gonna say, but it's um, a part of our culture. And it's also part of our culture um, to, 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 to just have little 
pauses. But what happens in other people's cultures, like so many people are used to filling in the space. You, you want all of the space to be filled in. So if I'm talking and it looks like I'm at a loss for, like I can't think of the word, people try to put the word in there for me. As soon as somebody puts the word in there for me, the conversation is pretty well done for me because then I know they're, I don't, I don't know, I don't, I don't need to be rescued. I, I will come up with the word eventually, or, or if I want to, if, if I really can't think of the word, I'll say, who knows, you know what the word is? Um, but allowing for wait time. Also, when you ask a student a question, sometimes the students need a, a bit of time to, to think about it and they can't make a snap, snap answer and giving students the, the time to think about it before um, you, you pick someone to, to, give, to give the answer, that's important. It's also important when an indigenous child or probably from other cultures too, if they're trying to tell you a story and it's taking a long time, let them have that time because that's important to them. There was a few years ago that I was doing some professional development with um, teachers in Kingston. They were um, reading the book that I had written that this is from. Um, and we had invited in a young indigenous person. In, we were in Kingston and Kingston has hospitals. So there are a lot of people from the James Bay area that get um, brought down to Kingston for the hospital system. To, to like go on dialysis or cancer treatment or, or whatever it is and families have to move down there. So we brought in a, a young person who had moved to Kingston recently for her parents' health. And we wanted to, uh, we, we asked her what her experience was like as an indigenous student in the board. And what she said was um, she was in a circle with, probably about 20 adults and this one young teenager. And she started to talk about how when she first came to Kingston, she had her really long hair. And some of the girls in the class said to her, why is your hair so long? And she said, well, because it's, it's our culture, it's our connection to our roots. It's important for us to have our, our, our hair long. And um, a couple of days later, out on the schoolyard, the same girls came up to her and one of them was chewing bubble gum and spat the bubble gum into her hair. And so it got caught in her hair. And she said, oh, why did you do that? Now it's like sticking in my hair. And one of the other girls reached into her own backpack and pulled out some scissors and cut off the hair with the bubble gum attached, which is like horrible. Um, it's um, because, especially since the girl had said like her hair was her connection to her roots. But when the girl cut the hair, and the indigenous girl complained. She said, well, now you don't have to be anchored down by your roots, like you're not stuck to your roots. So um, the indigenous girl went to, like the Ojakri girl went to the person on duty and said, you know, these girls like spat gum in my hair and then they cut it out. And the, the, the other girls were saying, oh, it was an accident. It's never an accident if you take scissors to someone's hair. It was an accident and the teacher on duty did nothing. So the Ojikri girl then went in to um, talk to the principal or vice principal and still nothing happened. But when she was telling this to the group of adults, she started to cry. And I had already like, explained to them, you know, even if a person cries, if they're having a hard time, just be patient and wait because they'll compose themselves and they'll continue to talk. So she started to cry and every adult like just sat there patiently and like looking at her empathetically too and sympathetically and not trying to rescue her. And finally she continued her story. And at the end, she said, that's the first time in her life that she felt that educators actually listened to her, um, that her voice was being heard by, by teachers because even though she had stopped talking because she was crying, they still waited for her to finish her story. And I, I think that's important to know for Indigenous kids. For me, even as an adult, 
as soon as somebody interrupts me, I stop talking. So, um, well, unless Calpana interrupts me because there's a question or something, that's okay. But normally, if I if I'm trying to get an idea across and somebody interrupts me, the conversation's over. Um, I, I think using uh, drama and I think using storytelling is important too. That's one of the ways like, I've been learning Anishinaabemwin, the Ojibwe language for the past, I don't know, eight or nine years, I think. And the first language speakers who teach us just tell us the story in Ojibwe and they act out or they draw um, so that we can understand. It's the same way when I first started teaching, when I started teaching French, um, I had, I, I wouldn't use English, I just have flashcards to, sh to teach the vocabulary. And then I would act out or I would draw really quickly what was happening so that the students would understand. Um, and I think that's important, an important way for students to learn. Um, I, I know that back in the early 80s when I was teaching, I was at one school, I taught grade, grades one to nine, one to nine um, French. And the students thought that I could not speak English. They, 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 it was core French, it was 20 minutes a day. Um, and, and it was 40 minutes for grade sevens and eights, but just 20 minutes a day. And the students would even talk to me in French on the schoolyard. And I remember like one November when it was a like parent interview time, the kids all said to their parents, there's no point in going to talk to Madame because she doesn't even speak English. So the um, parents would like come and they'd be trying to speak French to me. And I'd say to them, you know, I, I do speak English, just you're not allowed to tell your child <laughs> that I speak English because um, if they know that I'll speak English, then they're not gonna listen to me in French. So I, I, and the way I could do that was like using my puppets or using my drawing skills or using my drama using flashcards and that. I think um, using, okay. using authentic voice and um, uncovering bias too. Like we all have biases, we, we do. Like I'm, I'll admit right now, when I looked at that class and they were all blonde, I thought there is no, no way I'm gonna learn their names because they all look the same. Um, that's my own bias because um, I eventually, he didn't all look the same once I got to know them a bit better and I could tell them apart. But that's like part of my bias was like, I, I don't just judging them by their hair color, which is not a good thing. Like knowing, knowing your biases and then working to get over them is important. I think that like history, for example, was not written by this, um, by the indigenous people the history of Canada. So um, when, when I was teaching grade seven and eight and I had to teach about the Métis rebellions, well, I'm, I'm teaching like about heroes for me. Like my family's related to Gabriel Dumont or Dumont. And um, he wasn't like a rebel, like they were protecting our land. So I would give them the Métis point of view of, of that. and. My students, I, I would encourage them to question, like when we were talking about history, like who, whose whose story is this, and whose voice is not being heard in in this um, particular snapshot of history. And um, I, the, my students became like very good at understanding, like that history is written from the side of the oppressor. And whenever we would look at anything in history, they would always say, well, I know whose voice is not being mentioned. I, like we should hear from somebody from this other side because uh, there's always like two or three sides to um, every story. And it's like the same thing with like history as it's being made too. Like people's voices are being oppressed even today. Um, and it's important to have um, students have a critical lens to what they're seeing, even if they're in kindergarten. They they can I I, I love it when kids um, know that 
they're not getting the whole story. And it's so important today too, with this digital world, like grandma Google doesn't know everything. Like they, they have, to, it's not always correct. And it's important um, to hear other voices too. Um, your assessment methods. I think that's super important for me. I was, I, I suffered from anxiety as a kid. I had test anxiety, something fierce. Um, like I would wake up and I'd vomit because I was so nervous about my test, but I still went to school and wrote the test. Since COVID, it seems like practically everybody has anxiety and they don't necessarily know how to handle their anxiety or they're not like forced to go to school, even if they're on their deathbed, <laughs> like, like we were when I was a kid. Um, so having different um, assessment methods, like being able to observe, being able to write notes, be able to self-assess um, so that students aren't um, getting that test anxiety and not being able to show up at, at school because they know there's a test that day. Um, we, can, we can test other ways. It doesn't always have to be like a pen and paper test. I, I think that allowing students to send you in a recording or um, being able to create a song about what they learned. There, there are so many different ways to assess that I, I don't think that we need to be doing like standardized tests. Yes, I said it. Because standardized tests are, are never good for Indigenous people in yeah, because um, quite often they deal with things that people never have contact with. Like I haven't looked at a, any of those standardized tests like lately, but I remember when they would have things like zucchinis in them or like high rises and stuff that you would never see in the north. And if, if you don't have any context like how can you write about that um using land-based inquiry my favorite thing so that's a picture of me like many years ago tanning this this whole week i'm at a tanning camp i, I today i was outside for like five hours in the lovely warm weather tanning hides like we were working on two deer um a moose and a bison today with students and what a rich um, experience that is for those students. I invited some of our students from the Faculty of Education over. I said, come on over and help us tan. So two showed up today, but they're, they're planning to bring more tomorrow. And there's a couple of classes coming tomorrow and the next day to come and do some tanning with us. Um, when you get opportunities to do something like that with a class, it, it's such a, uh, a rich way of learning, um, even though it's cold outside, but they learn how to um, be more resilient, more resilient. When I was teaching, I would say to my students, right in September, dress to go outside because we will be going outside every single day. Like it didn't matter if it was raining, if it's raining, bring your raincoat, bring your umbrella, um, if it's snowing, we're still going to go outside. If it's minus like a whole lot, we're going to go outside, but we're probably not going to go too long because I don't want anyone to get frostbite. But um, my students would dress to go outside. And, and we did. We spent so much time outside. I was lucky for most of my career, I, I took other than like about two, two, three years, for like 27 of the years, I was in uh, schools that had like massive playgrounds like big hills and um, structures out there and nice shady trees and one of them had a, an outdoor classroom up on a hill where we could go outside and take our lessons outside and I that's important my students loved um, at both of those schools there were killdeer that would um, nest every year at the one school the killdeer were not too smart they always built their nest on third base and my students were so good um, the students of the school, they um, didn't want to hurt the kill deer. So we, we moved to third base and um, to a different location. 
so that we could still play baseball but not hurt the kill deer. But then usually adults also use that field at night so the adults would um, move the kill deer nest, which was not good for the kill deer. At the other school, the kill deer was smart. The kill deer were smarter, smarter there. They always built their um, nest in a naturalized area, but we had a walking path that went by it and they built it in about like 10 feet in. But it was so cute because I'd say to the kids, you're going to know which one's the papa kill deer because he's going to try to lead us away from the nest. He's going to pretend his wing is broken and he's going to hop around like with this broken wing and just to lead us away because he's such a good dad that he wants to protect his little wife and the, and the kids. So um, the kids love that. Like every day we'd go for a walk there, we'd see the little father walk away with his broken wing. And then once he was far enough away, he'd fly. But it was good learning for the kids to be able to um, see how nature tries to protect its own too. Differentiating instruction. We all know about that. And like, it's super important. Like I know I'm not doing that right now, but if you were kids, I would be like singing new songs and doing other things. So that is more fun. It's important because um, we're not all readers. I like to read, but a lot of kids don't learn well from um, having to read or being read to. Um, but then others just love it to sit and be read to. But being able to like access all of the different ways of, of learning within the classroom isn't important. My kids used to make math wraps and all kinds of fun things when you had to. Um, um, creating meaningful connections and engaging, whether it's students or, or the parents of the students, if you can, um, if they can relate to what you're doing. Like I find in math, like sometimes like we're doing fractions or something and like a parent will write in a note saying, I don't know how to figure out, like if this one has like two thirds of a pie and that one's got like three sixths of the pie, who's got more pie? Um, because they haven't had to do that. Um, they don't know how to work with fractions. So teaching them fractions, like especially in um, cooking is important because we have like a lot of our recipes, the old, the old recipes are like quarter cup, half a cup. Um, yeah, that's important to be able to use fractions there. I just gotta tell a story, but when I was, I had a doctor once um, when I was in university and his wife, they, they were, pretty new to Canada and they'd come from a country that was metric and Canada didn't become metric until 1976. So Canada was like newly metric and she, uh, like, a, she, I was like, I, I, we became friends. So she was talking to me one day and she's like, I've been trying to make refrigerator cookies, but your recipes are so hard to understand here. I tried using three cups of flour. I tried using four cups of flour, but it never turns out right. So I looked at the recipe and I said that three slash four, that means three quarters of a cup, not three cups or four cups, it's three quarters. And she didn't understand um, the fractions. So I had to teach her fractions so that she could cook with um, Canadian recipes at the time. But I also showed her how to do it in metric because I'd been living in Europe for six years so I was already metric before we came back to Canada in 1976. Um, the, they need to see that what they're learning is going to be helpful in the outside world so it's important to do that and the parents sometimes you have to help the parents see that it's useful in the outside world too. Um, for this one um, partnerships and cooperation. Th this is up in another northern community. I think this, I forget, it's Sandy Lake or Nishkanaga or something. But um, Indigenous people and police don't have like the best of relationships. But it seems to me these two, I think these two police officers are actually Indigenous. And we invited them to an event that we were having 
which made the police feel really good. And at first the community was like, mm, police are here. But um, I, I think that it's important to, um, it's important for police to see indigenous people as more human than they have done or their history has. Like we just have to look at like how many murdered missing indigenous women and girls there are and how the police doesn't want to spend money to look for them. And I'm pretty sure that had it been like a white woman who was murdered and in the landfill in Winnipeg that people would have been digging up the landfill. Um, we're overrepresented in the prison system, especially women, like indigenous women, I think make up a third of the women in, in prison. And yet like we're only like 3% of the population, indigenous people are only 3% of the population. So um, I, I think people that are in jobs that are not used to seeing us as humans um, get to see us as, as humans more and realize that um, we're not all criminals. We're not all, like so many indigenous people are in prison that had they not been indigenous, they wouldn't be in prison. Questioning and challenging. I, I, I talked about that with like whose voice is there, but also um, I, in my school, I always ran the student vote and I encourage the students to look at um, all of the candidates platforms and to see which one fit best with them. Not because, just because um, their parents vote one way doesn't mean that they're going to vote the same way. And like I, I did, like I look at my nieces and nephews, they don't vote the same way as their parents for some of them, which is like a good thing. <laughs> but, um, yeah, I, I always had students question and, and challenge and not challenge like rudely, but be polite about it. And like something like if, if there was some rule they thought should be changed, like for example, if the grade sixes thought they should be allowed to go to the dance that the grade sevens and eights are going to, um, I'd say to them, well, who's running the dance? Write a letter to them and explain to them why you should be included. Um, and instead of like just blindly sitting by and never saying, well, maybe we could be doing that too. You know, I, I think it's important for kids to know that they can ask questions and um, challenge the status quo a little bit, but you don't have to be like rude about it to be it, to do it politely. And I think the most important thing like for me is encouraging, like encouraging the students to, um, follow their dreams for, for noticing what the strengths are and encouraging them to follow that dream. I, I remember uh, years, a few years ago, one of my um, colleagues' sons was in my grade um, five class. And it was like the first day of school. And like we were first day of school, I'm like getting to know them and stuff. And I do silly things and we change our voices and, and whatever. And, I noticed like right away he had like this fantastic announcer voice and and like he was so dramatic so at the very first recess I said to his dad like wow like your son is really gifted in like he can change his voice like so many ways and he's like so dramatic and he said you have the record no teacher has ever noticed his gift on the first day of school um encouraging kids to do the things that they like to do and the things that they're they're good at. Like um, there was a girl in my class who liked to play the guitar and I was not necessarily good at music. I was like, I don't know, two weeks ahead of them on the recorder when I had to teach them the recorder, but she liked to play the guitar. So I'd say to her, bring in your guitar. We could have a sing in class if you want to do that, or you can sing to us and, and she would. And now she's a musician, you know, and encourage kids like for me, I would never have been here if I had not been encouraged by other teachers because I was terminally shy. I would not want to be the one to answer the question in class. If I know the, if I knew the answer, I was never going to raise my hand because, you know, we're supposed to be humble and I didn't want to look like I was 
I knew the answer or anything. So I just like raise my finger or something like barely noticeable that the teacher would notice. Um, and, and even when I first started teaching classes, like I could teach my class, but I could never be in front of like the whole school in the gym. Um, but then people kept saying to me, well, well, Deb, you could do this. And, and they encouraged me. So that's how I got to be somebody who would do, would lead workshops or run for political whatever. Um, because people saw in me something that I didn't necessarily see in me. And sometimes, and I, that's what the students need is for somebody to encourage them to um, follow their gifts. And yeah, that's, I, I've been talking forever and ever. So um, following your heart, I think that's important. And the word for, you know, Ojibwe for heart is day and it's in uh, a lot of things. Um, like Odeman is our strawberry, it means heartberry. Dewegan is our drum because it makes the sound of our heart. Our Dodem has the word Ode in it, which is our, that's our clan. Um, win it's um, the way of the heart. Um, that's our Ojibwe medicine society. Yeah, I, and always, always, always look at your students, the students, people in your care with your heart instead of instead of your eyes. That's the most important thing that I say to teacher candidates at the Faculty of Education when I'm there. Um, the ones that are the that like appear to be the hardest to to love are the ones that need you to love them the most. So um, I don't know, I think we've been talking a long time, but maybe there's still time for questions. Deb, uh, thank you so much. Thank you so much for your presentation. Does anyone have any questions they'd like to offer and ask? Um, the chat was quite full and people were participating in the chat and they want all of the links that you've shared. So we've been copying those down to share with everyone. Awesome, thanks for Does that. Does anyone have any comments to share with Deb? You're welcome to unmute yourself and ask away. Isabel's got a nice big heart for everyone. Oh, thank you. Emma in the chat has said this was excellent. Thank you so much, Deb. Thank you. Pleasure. Um, yeah, so this is all from a book that I had written um, once I retired. I wrote it in 2013, but I think it was published in 2014, and it's just called First Nations Métis Inuit Student Success and it's through Pearson Education. And when I was asked to write the book, um, I said, that's a terrible title because that's the also the title of the ministry document and we should change the title. And they said, oh, before it's published, we'll change the title. I said, do you want me to give a example of the title? They said, no, we'll name it, we'll, we'll name it. And it came out as First Nations Métis Inuit Student Success which has not changed at all, but it's there. So thank you for joining us for this OT, OTF Connects webinar. Um, in the coming days, you'll see you'll receive a follow-up email, a link to the evaluation form. I also placed it in the chat for those who want to participate there. Um, all the resources Deb mentioned, we've been jotting them down and we'll put them in a nice little document for you, as well as her PowerPoint presentation and a link to the archive version of this. Several people asked if they could view this again and potentially share it with other people. So yes, you can once the link is up and the webinar is up and posted. Um, our next webinar is on December the 5th at 4.30 and it's Holocaust Education in Grade 6, supporting the new social studies curriculum with Cindy and Marilyn from Liberation 75. At this point, I do want to thank Deb for taking the time and participating in this workshop. I've had the honor and the pleasure of listening to Deb for, I would say, about two decades now, and I always walk away with more information than I came in with. So thank you for that and the resources you provided as well um, and your PowerPoint. It was just really direct and your examples and your scenarios of real life kids and how best to meet their needs. Um, I think everyone can take away and maybe support our students a little bit better. So thank you for that. Thank you very much. 
And on behalf of OTF, I'd like to thank all of our participants for taking time out of their evening. Um, we know you're very busy and we thank you for taking the time to be with us today. Have a wonderful session and hopefully we'll see you in another session in the next coming weeks. Take good care and have a lovely evening. Good night.